University of Arkansas and then trained in Indiana. Um, I was fortunate enough to hear her uh, speak quite a bit on this topic at the uh, last disaster training that we had here in the community. So this is a really um, very interesting topic. It's a things that a lot of us maybe hear about and think about, but don't know much about. So uh, looking forward to your comments, Kylie. Thanks for joining us, and I know it'll be very interesting. Awesome, thank you for having me. Uh, excited to be here and be involved with MTAC. I do a lot of stuff with the health, uh, Metro Atlanta Healthcare Preparedness Coalition, which I know is a product of MTAC and just shows how strong you guys have been throughout the years. Um, so I appreciate y'all inviting me to talk about things that are near and dear to my heart, which are things that go boom and bang and keep us up at night. <laughs> Um, so today we'll be talking about the trauma considerations in C. Bernie events. Uh, as the disaster medicine fellow, uh, like Dr. Green was saying, I trained in emergency medicine at Indiana University, uh, where we had a strong disaster program as well. But essentially, my job is to study how disasters happen, educate people on how disasters happen, and really advocate for the local sort of response systems that we have. Um, and please let me know if there's any delay in slides or anything like that. But as long as we're moving forward, I want to dive into what C-Bernie is. And C-Bernie is Chemical, Biological, Radiation, Nuclear, and Explosives. So that's the acronym that we use. And you'll hear C-Burn, C-Bernie. Sometimes people drop the E just sort of depending on what they're talking about. This can be related to accidents like tankers rolling over or manufacturing plant accidents. But frequently in society, what keeps us up at night and keeps the trauma team up at night in particular is our growing concern over non-accidental terroristic events that can disrupt our communities and cause trauma to our communities. Now, the military does have a strong response to see Bernie events. As you can see, the 415th Chemical Brigade is out of, chemi uh, is out of Greenville, South Carolina. And what they do is sort of study these events and help the nation prepare for response. But realistically, disasters start local and end local. We don't need to look any further than Chernobyl or Haiti or New Orleans post Katrina to sort of understand that the local population is going to be who's impacted greatest by any one of these particular events. In particular, the first 12 hours are going to be what matters most, and that's before the federal teams arrive. Federal response at best is going to look like 24 hours, at most is going to look like 72 hours. So local communities need to be able to respond, and that's where I come in and disaster medicine sort of has a niche. And when we look back at the C. Bernie breakdown of things, uh, we do have all of the aspects, but we're not going to cover bio today. And the reason for that is that category A biological agents and category B and C all uh, categorized through the CDC for level of risk, category A being the highest risk, are all things that are going to take a little bit of time to show their presentation of symptoms. So, for example, anthrax, botulism, the plague, smallpox, tularemia, and viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, if we might recall, can have incubation periods of up to 21 days. And so what that means for us is that it doesn't really have an impact on our trauma response, nor will we actually know about that agent in particular until much later. Additionally, I'm not going to dive into explosives today um, because while I do love explosives, I think there are other experts that have covered the topics. Um, specifically, if we look back at the August 2023 MTAC uh, lecture series, we went over firearms. In June of 2023, we went, went over blast injuries. And one uh, lecture you're going to hear me plug a good bit throughout this is going to be the January 2024 inhalation injuries by Dr. Murphy, who's a toxicologist. And covering her topic as well in the chemical today, um, I think if you're looking for a bit of a deeper dive, uh, watching her inhalation injury lecture is excellent. So what that leaves us with is going to be the chemical, radiation, and nuclear. So let's go ahead and dive headfirst into the chemical uh, exposures and our trauma considerations. But first, why should we care about the chemical trauma response? More than 3 billion tons of regulated hazardous materials are known to be transported in the U.S. each year. This is going to include explosives, poisonous materials, corrosive materials, flammable materials, and radioactive materials. Additionally, organizations like the Coalition to Prevent Chemical Disasters indicate that we have a lot more plant leaks than we might think about. They have an interactive map that you can check out on their website, but just zooming in on our region and the region our, uh, our team helps respond to, you can see that just since 2021, we've had several significant leaks that have impacted our communities. Additionally, 
more and more plants are coming available looking at green energy alternatives to fossil fuels. And while these are excellent, they are going to pose unique chemical changes for our communities and things that we need to be prepared to respond to. So let's take it back to the basics. Let's say that you get word that there is a chemical exposure at a major plant in your town and you as the trauma team or trauma responder in some capacity, whether it be pre-hospital or in hospital, want to be prepared to take care of patients. But how do we know which chemicals are around us or in our communities? Luckily, there are many state and federal regulations that make transparency required so that local communities are protected. Specifically, one is the Emergency Planning and Community Rights to Know Act that details the requirements of establishing emergency response commissions and local emergency planning committees. So that might even be like MTAC being involved or the Metrolina Healthcare Preparedness Coalition being involved in creating chemical annexes, plans for chemical disasters, as well as getting some funding from ASPR to be able to fund these sort of resource reach out programs. Additionally, manufacturers and non-manufacturers of hazardous materials must have an MD, MS, MDS, sorry, <laughs> material safety data sheet, MSDS. Um, and what they are are, as you can see in the picture, uh, product identifiers to let us know how to respond to these sort of events. Uh, they also have to have facility safety sheets for all tier one and tier two chemicals that are kept in a binder somewhere in multiple areas throughout a facility, as well as any sort of toxic release has to be reported to the EPA immediately. So theoretically, we should have a good knowledge of what's going on in our community and what chemicals are out there. But what do we do when we don't know what chemicals are around us? Because right, we're, we're trauma responders. There might not be the time to know what's going on or have looked through a giant book of chemicals. What we're going to do and our framework for looking into this is going to be that we assume the worst. And what the worst is, is the high risk chemicals, right? This is a uh, chart straight out of Tintinales, which is like the religious text of emergency medicine. And what it is, is it divides the categories of high risk chemicals into the seven simple categories to be able to follow. The simple asphyxiants, the irritant gases or droplets, the agents that disrupt delivery of oxygen to tissues or disrupt mitochondrial uh, energy flow, as well as nerve agents, incapacitating agents, and vesicants. So these seven different categories, this chart gets sort of overwhelming and before you sort of get sort of glazed over looking at a chart like this, what I want to focus on for us today is the treatment, right? Because Realistically, we're taking care of trauma patients who need trauma care, and we're just keeping it these ideas that these chemical weapons have also been used or could have been used. So let's just look at the treatment and see how simple it is to take care of patients. First and foremost, we're going to decon everyone and throw oxygen on them. That is what I want to happen for every single patient who's exposed to any amount of chemical uh, irritant, whether it be you know peroxide or bleach from a household cleaning accident or some large bioweapon. The reason we need to decontaminate and do oxygen is because that's going to take care of a lot of the initial treatment uh, factors that we need to consider. Decontamination is going to include getting trauma naked. So any sea burning event that we are concerned about, people need to get all the way naked, not sort of naked, not a little bit naked, all the way naked. Because in chemical reactions, external removal of any sort of uh, clothing, uh, protective equipment, things like that, is going to be over 80% effect effective at taking away the chemicals themselves. So just by decontaminating them and putting on a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters, this is what we've already done. This is the treatment we've already sort of handled and marked out in red at the bottom. And as you can see, that's taken out half of the treatments that we have for these high-risk chemicals. Now that we've covered half of what we can provide patients, I wanna dive into six chemi chemicals in particular that are gonna be ones that we want to keep an eye out for, look for their symptoms and provide unique treatments too. First is gonna be hydrofluoric acid. You might've heard of hydrofluoric acid before because it's the same chemical that's used when you go to buy a new car, buy a used car and they say, oh, we'll etch your VIN into your windows so that you can make sure that it doesn't get stolen or things like that. Um, but it used to be used in etching, and now it's used a lot more widely in cleaning agents, rust removal agents, semiconductor industry, even manufacturing fertilizer and plastics. And it is an incredibly strong uh, acidic agent where the fluoride ions are going to bind up to all of our calcium and our magnesium in our blood supply, and that's going to cause some, some changes for our body. First, in the physical exam, it's going to cause pain out of proportion. The pain that they are experiencing is pretty unimaginable for us. 
So as first responders or people responding to people in the trauma bay, we would need to consider that we need to titrate our opioid use or our pain medication use to their pain and not numbers that we're used to. You might be seeing, you know, doses of fentanyl of two, three, four, five hundred, and this person's still awake and screaming at you, um, saying that they're in pain. So, like I said, titrate to apnea, titrate to hypoxia, titrate to mental status. The numbers that you're using is going to be very different than what you might be comfortable with, as long as their hemodynamics are supporting those uh, redoses. Additionally, small little uh, amounts of hydrofluoric acid can be treated with a uh, calgonate. What calgonate is, is calcium mixed into like a jelly, uh, calcium gluconate jelly, uh, and that's going to help with the local distribution of the calcium at that local level. But if somebody exposed to like 5, 10, even 20 percent body surface area of hydrofluoric acid burns, that's when we need to start thinking about calcium gluconate IV, because what that's going to do is help supplement the calcium gluconate that's getting bonded to the fluoride ions. And the reason we care about that is because, as you can see here on the left side, um, for my non-EKG readers or the people who just see squiggly lines, what we're seeing is our QTC is widening out, and that can cause fatal arrhythmias. So we really need to manage the calcium depletion uh, aggressively as along with the uh, pain control. The next is carbon monoxide, which Dr. Murphy with our toxicology program did an excellent job diving into and to her inhalation injury lecture. The thing that I want to talk about with carbon monoxide is just to consider is carbon monoxide happening here uh, with chemical burns or chemical reactions with carbon monoxide. What we're usually going to see are house fires or chemical plant fires because it's going to become a vaporized uh, byproduct of the reactions that are ongoing. So you just want to have thought about it. The other thing you want to do is order our carboxyhemoglobin level, which at least at CMC Maine, we can run that off of our VBGs. If you can't run one of those, um, you might want to just draw a lab off in a VBG syringe and see if you can run it to another lab or if there are other opportunities for you guys to be able to test for this. But regardless, if you are worried about, about carboxy hemoglobin and carbon monoxide, you just want to get Poison Center on the phone and they'll help you out. That's a similar case with cyanide poisoning. Cyanide is going to be a product that we see burning off whenever there's a house fire, whenever there's a chemical plant fire. Uh, sources of cyanide toxicity include the synthetic polymers that are used in building materials. So a lot of the manufacturing plants that we see or plant fires might have cyanide as well. And how we're going to treat that is with um, essentially B12. It's a uh, hydroxycobalamin, which is um, a hydroxylated form of B12. Um, but additionally, it needs very close monitoring. So you're going to talk to your poison control agents. Unfortunately, unlike carbon monoxide, there's no perfect test for cyanide poisoning. You might see insane uh, elevated lactate, like up to like 20 plus for some people, as well as altered mental status or difficulty breathing because their mitochondrial dis uh, oxygenation has been disrupted. So if you're seeing these signs, then you want to definitely get a specialist involved who can help you while you continue to go through your ABCs and secondary survey. I do want to note with both of these that you're going to want to deliver your antidotes as you're going and not necessarily um, delay them until after your primary or secondary survey, because if you have a significant enough of a concern, you want to be doing things in parallel and not waiting till after. The next chemical that I want to dive into is organophosphates or nerve agents. Organophosphates are like sarin gas um, and are things that we've been very concerned about, especially after the Tokyo subway incident. And you might have a couple of ways to remember the mnemonics for these, one being dumbbells, where the symptoms we'd be experiencing would be defecation, urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, lethargy, and salivation. Personally, I've never done well with remembering acronyms. So what I think of when I think of organophosphates or nerve agents is I think of like a snotty three, four-year-old kid when they have a URI or like a stomach bug, right? So what they are, what, they're, what are they doing? They're crying, they're having horrible diarrhea, they're snot coming out of their nose, they're hacking things up, they just look miserable. And that's what you're going to see with nerve agent poisoning. When we do see nerve agent poisoning in the acute period, we want to make sure we've decontaminated people like we already have. But then we want to reach for our antidotes as quickly as possible. Two antidotes exist or two components uh, make up an antidote. And the first of which is going to be atropine. Atropine we might be used to using for bradycardia, things like that. 
But what atropine is going to do in these scenarios is dry up all of those secretions. And we're titrating how much atropine that we give to the amount of secretions that they're having. So if they're still snotting, still hacking, still showing signs of bronchospasm and pulmonary edema, keep giving atropine. I mean, you can be given 10, 10 milligrams at times, um, and, and that would be totally normal. Uh, it's really just titrating to that dryness. The antidote that you see there is called Duodote. It's just one of the patented release options uh, that has both atropine in it as well as 2PAM. 2PAM is pralidoxamine. The reason we call it 2PAM is because it's not fun to say pralidoxamine, but what it does is it prevents any progression of the nerve agent. So while the nerve agent cannot be undone for some period of time, usually a few hours, what it can do is stop the progression of symptoms. So getting a duodote into a patient is more important than anything in their primary survey. I mean, you want to be handling their breathing and circulation and all of those things, but you are going to make them so much worse or they're going to suffer so many more symptoms if we can't get that duodote on board. So while somebody is preparing for intubation because they're having such significant bronchospasms, make sure you're hitting them with uh, two to three duodotes is the adult dose. Um, but with that, you might be thinking, I've never even seen a duodote before. I don't know where to find them. And so you might find that you don't think about duodotes very often, but they're a lot closer than you might believe. At Carolina's Medical Center, we have over 2,400 of them just sitting off of the back alley. Um, I say sitting off the back alley, like they're easy to get to, but um, they're very, very close to the emergency department. Uh, but we've got over 2,400 doses just sitting uh, in our hospital, as well as at all other major hospitals in the region. And the reason for this is what's called strategic national stockpiles. When we are continue to have difficulties with relations with other countries, as well as terroristic events, the strategic national stockpile system has set up various things called chem packs. And what they do is they house antidotes to duodote or antidotes to uh, organophosphates or nerve gases so that we can make sure that we're taking care of patients because time is of the essence. And so this is uh, in North Carolina, what a chem pack looks like for us, just one package. And you can see we've got 1200 uh, duodotes. We've got two packages at uh, at CMC, which is why we've got 2400. It also has diazepam to help with any seizures coming from the nerve agents, extra atropine and pediatric dosing through um, individual vials. The next chemical I'd like to touch base with or the, that we have to be worried about is opioids, right? Um, as we're seeing, while we always thought that nerve agents were going to be the biggest terroristic threat to our nation, we're finding quickly that opioids might be a bigger threat. Specifically, these are incapacitating agents that are becoming more readily available, particularly because we're dealing with them in the microgram, which means it's much easier to hide them and provide them to people through aerosolization or water supplies. So just going through those six chemicals, um, as well as those agents of uh, reversal that we talked about, we've covered all of the treatments we can really provide for high risk chemicals. And how did we do that? We decontaminated them. We put them on a non-rebreather mask. We gave them, we considered whether they needed Narcan, a cyano kit, calcium if they were hydrofluoric acid burns. Um, we considered whether they need methylene blue for uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and then whether they needed duodote for any sort of uh, nerve gas agents. But there are a couple unique considerations that I want you to think about as we proceed with the trauma considerations. The first is chemical burns. When we think about chemical burns, I want you to think of them similar to our thermal burns. The solution is going to be dilution. These patients may have suffered severe injuries, but they're not thermal burns in the sense that they, unless they have uh, airway irritation from just bronchospasm, like uh, mentioned in Dr. Murphy's asphyxiant lectures, you just need to get the chemical off of them. Hopefully this has happened in the pre-hospital setting, but it can take five to 20 minutes of constant irrigation to get this chemical off, depending on the viscosity. As you can imagine, like a tarry, sugary substance, it's gonna be much more difficult to get off than say a very thin, uh, more like gasoline-like substance. Additionally, one other consideration I want you to keep in the back of your mind is the lithium ion battery and specifically lithium in your communities. So as you can see, Greenville, South Carolina is welcoming a new lithium ion battery uh, manufacturer, but what does that mean for our safety? Well, as you can see, lithium falls into the alkali metals, which to throw it all the way back to like 
chemistry in high school is the far left side of the periodic table. And you thought you'd never hear about the periodic table again. Well, you were wrong. <laughs> um, but what, what's on the left side of the periodic table is the lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. And the reason that all of these are important is that alkali metals do not like water. Um, they're great for energy sources, specifically lithium, and lithium is used in all EV batteries. But they are um, very, very flammable is not the right word, but very annoyed by water. Um, this is what lithium looks like if you put it in water. What happens is lithium displaces the hydrogen on H2O and causes it to burn, but it's not burning in an oxygen uh, forming way, so it can burn without oxygen. This is a fire we're not used to fighting, and as such, these lithium ion batteries can burn very hot and don't need water, so it's very difficult to put out. Um, so if we we're responding to an injured person at a lithium plant and this person was you know, knocked down by a conveyor belt or things like that, one thing we don't wanna do is we don't wanna decontaminate them. This is the one time that I want you to stop, pause, consider everything else before you start spraying water at them. You might cause them, I genuinely mean this, to ignite if somebody is covered in lithium powder from a lithium plant accident and you start to decontaminate them, which could hurt you, hurt, obviously hurt them, um, so make sure if you're responding to any sort of lithium related injuries that you talk to a specialist, preferably one from the plant, but if not, you can talk to one of these friends. The poison control, we all know well um, from the yuck faces of the, like the 90s, right? They offer 24 hour planning and response uh, and can be reached via 2221222. They're very easy to be found. But you might not have heard about these other two. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry offers a 24-hour emergency number for health-related support in hazardous materials. And then the Chemical Transportation Emergency, er, emergency Center, they're supposed to keep track of all of the movement of chemicals. So if there's like a, a interstate accident, rollover, things like that, and they should be able to help you with any sort of planning of movements and knowing where things are being moved. And with that, we have covered the chemical side, so it's time to move on to the radiation and nuclear side. So why should we care about radiation and nuclear response? Specifically, why should we in North Carolina? And I don't say any of this to scare you, I just want you to know what's going on in your area. Nuclear in North Carolina gener is generated by nuclear energy from five reactors. You might not realize that we have five reactors around us, but they do generate 32% of our state's total energy. And if you were, are in South uh, Carolina and you thought you were safe, you certainly are not. Um, the, South Carolina has a little bit more with seven nuclear reactors generating almost 60% of the state's total energy. So when you look at it together, if you consider the Carolinas to be a state, they would be shortly behind Illinois and the overall power production and the, as far as the United States is concerned, just like literally by a few uh, megawatts behind Illinois at this point. So with all of these giant reactors around us, um, what does that mean for our safety? Well, if you were to ask the American population, what you would find is that 58% of people right now are worried about nuclear war. And they're specifically worried about nuclear bombs being dropped on us, which is definitely a concern. But in my opinion, uh, that concern could be mitigated through a lot of strategies um, before uh, any sort of bomb were to hit stateside, but instead we should be concerned also about the potential of terrorism on our already existing nuclear infrastructure. So I don't want to scare you. I don't want you to think that nuclear power is bad and nuclear power is fantastic. But as a trauma team, we do need to know how nuclear power works and when we're going to be concerned about exposure versus contamination and how to respond to these nuclear events. To do that well, we need to dive into radiation basics a little bit. Um, this is going to be a small amount of chemistry and physics that you once probably knew but have since forgotten, um, but you'll be surprised by how easy it is to know the important things. First, when we talk about radiation, what are we talking about? And really, it's just wavelengths. It's the same wavelengths that we use for our power lines, our radio and television antennas, our infrared, uh, the visible light that we see in our everydays. Uh, but when we get into the ionizing radiation, that's where we start to see the X-rays, the gamma rays, the more uh, dangerous things. So they all exist on this spectrum, right? But what we worry about with ionizing radiation is going to be that high frequency, high energy um, wavelengths, right? 
these low energy, low frequency things um, are going to be how we communicate every day. But the high frequency, high energy is what we worry about and call ionizing radiation. And the reason we call it ionizing radiation is because it creates ions. Just an ion is just a negatively charged molecule, right? And so it's going to free up a negatively charged molecule into a free radical. You may have heard of free radicals when you're like looking at smoothies and they say like neutralizes free radicals, helps with you know oxidation, things like that. And that what they're getting at is that free radicals cause disruption in our body, but they're not something that's unique to ionizing radiation. Free radicals exist as a byproduct of air pollution, of UV light, of smoking, of regular metabolism in our body. And what happens is the high energy hits this H2O molecule, pops the hydrogen off, and now we have this charged sort of angry atom that can attack our DNA and it, it causes DNA damage. This is a totally normal process that our body goes through every day and is independent of ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is just one of the causes of it. So our body has been exposed to this for thousands of thousands of years, right? We are, the free radicals are nothing new. Um, so this damaged DNA, our body over tens of thousands of years has developed systems in order to be able to respond to that. And what our body does is goes through a whole bunch of things of acronyms that maybe we knew first or second year of med school, but have since forgotten. And essentially, the summation of this is if the DNA is damaged, it either can be repaired if it's minor or the cell gets killed if it's too major. And that's where the radiation matters, right? We can repair small stuff. We can repair minor doses, but big doses, big scary doses are going to cause cellular death. And that's what causes us to have problems. But all radiation isn't bad. Realistically, in our background, ra radon and thoron are common coming up from the ground. If you've ever had to install like a radon abatement system in your basement, uh, I came from Indiana. So like radon was huge up in Indiana. Um, but it also comes from the sky. It's terrestrial. It comes from space as well as medical background radiation. Like if you were to get a CT or any sort of nuke med studies. So our body is used to having some amount of background radiation and some amount of medical radiation. And there's arguments that it's okay for us. Um, we used to believe that the linear no threshold model, that that red line in the middle was the uh, understood model of any amount of radiation is bad and we should prevent any amount of radiation from happening to us. But that's not necessarily the truth anymore. That's what we believed in the 50s. And while the 50s were good for some things, our understanding of radiation didn't seem to come great from that period of time. What most uh, radiation physicists believe now is that bottom line, the like lime green, and that's what's called the hormesis theory. And what the hormesis theory is, is that there's some amount of radiation that's actually good for our body because it stresses our body to have those DNA repair mechanisms and continue to push our body to turn over cells that can't undergo DNA repair. So if the cell is no longer able to undergo DNA repair, it dies and that's good for us. So just know that there are these two models for understanding things and a little bit of radiation isn't, is by most people not deemed to be harmful. But with that in mind, a lot of radiation is going to be harmful, right? So we want to know how to protect ourselves from radiation, especially in the trauma bay or taking care of patients who have been exposed. To reduce radiation exposure, both for ourselves as healthcare responders and for our patients, there's a few things we want to do. First, we want to limit time, then we want to increase our distance, and then we want to use any sort of shielding. Time is a linear construct as it is related to uh, radiation exposure. And what that means is if I'm in X zone for one minute and I decide to stay there for two minutes, I'm going to have received double that dose, right? Because it's a one to one ratio. If I double the time, I double the exposure. And while that's helpful, what's more helpful uh, if we're going to protect ourselves is going to be the distance. When you look at this reaction or this uh, equation, what you're going to see is that distance, which is R, is squared, right? And so what that means is we are working with inverse squares whenever we talk about our safety and distance from radiation. So if I'm one foot away from a source, I'm receiving, let's say, a full dose. If I step one extra foot back, so I doubled my distance, I've now quartered my exposure. So distance is going to be huge for having any sort of exposure injuries for this. That's why if you've ever seen me in a trauma bay, I'm not running out of the room to get away from a uh, mobile x-ray. All you need to be is you know two feet away to avoid scatter. So I just take one big step away and then I turn around because I don't want my thyroid exposed. Um, but 
it's because distance is such a squared factor or inverse square rule. Next, we're going to talk about shielding, which is another way that we can protect ourselves, right? We have these highly fashionable things that we do or do not wear in the hospital, but our pre-hospital providers don't have options like this sometimes. So they have to think about the types of radiation and penetration that's going on for how they are going to stay safe. Uh, X-ray and gamma rays are what we tend to be most concerned about when we talk about radiation, and so that's going to be the ones that are blocked by lead, iron, or other thick metal plates. And our EMS providers don't really have these out in the field, but what they do have are these big blue rigs, right? And so they've got some thicker metal on there that they could be inside of there hiding from any sort of exposures. Additionally, if you saw the shielding, you see that water is one of those components. So hiding behind a concrete wall or even hiding behind your uh, team member because our bodies are made of 70% water, you know that their body will absorb far more of the dose than yours. So whenever you're responding to these sort of events, we just want to make sure that we're thinking about our time, our distance, and our shielding to make sure that we're staying as safe as possible. But we also need to think about whether we even need to consider those things, right? That's if we are being exposed to an ionizing radiation at that point in time, say a nuclear reactor is actively burning or you know, there's some amount of nuclear debris going on. But we also need to consider the difference between exposure and contamination. The concept of irradiation and contamination is like one of the most difficult concepts to talk about. But once you sort of understand this, you'll feel a lot safer being around radiation and understanding how to respond to radiation events. Irradiation is similar to the sun. What it means is if I go on vacation and I get sunburned, and I have a great time, but I am burned, my skin hurts, everything is awful, I'm peeling, all of those things. But then I come into work the next day and I take sign out from you. I'm not going to give you that radiation, right? It, it happened to my body, it hurt my body, but it's not something I can pass on to you because it's something the waves physically came through my body and caused that injury to my DNA, but I can't cause that to you. Contrast that with contamination, which is like mud. This is when nuclear disasters, dirty bombs, things like that, get the actual physical radioisotope on that person, and that nuclear isotope is still physically on them. So they're still being contaminated. When they're contaminated, they're still getting ir irradiated, but they're not, um, they, they still have the ability to get you contaminated as well because it's physically on them. And uh, that could be in the form of uranium, plutonium, any of the isotopes. But the contamination is more like mud where you can transfer it onto other people, whereas irradiation is something that you cannot pass on. To understand this a little bit further, let's dive into two examples. First example, let's say you're called out to a power plant after a control rod got stuck, and this exposed the fuel rod to low water levels. Um, the radiation supervisor was able to get it unwedged, but he was exposed to uranium-235 for approximately four minutes. This would be considered irradiation, right? His body has undergone radiation, but he doesn't have any of that uranium-235 on him. It just impacted him. So whenever he's taken out of that zone and you know gotten out of his uh, lovely yellow jumpsuit, he is not going to have any pose for getting anyone else sick. Contrast that to people in this scenario. Let's say that a truck is leaving LCI uh, with some nuclear uh, medicine debris, and unfortunately it suffers a rollover accident on one of our streets. Um, EMS personnel arrive on scene and start to resuscitate the driver, but they get covered in this brown stuff um, in this scenario, and now everyone's covered in this. These people are contaminated and still actively being irradiated by whatever that contaminant is. See how it's like a mud on them? It's physically on their bodies, and so we have to get that mud off to get them safe and to make sure our healthcare responders are safe. Most contamination is going to be externally. Um, it's going to be on our physical body, skin, all of those things. But there's a couple ways that contamination can get internal. One is through like shrapnel, through like open wounds, things like that. Those are fairly easy to handle um, from the trauma side. We know how to handle those things. Um, but the second way is inhalation. The reason we worry about inhalation is because it can get stuck in our tissues and continue to cause damage to our tissues until our body is able to flush it out, which can be for you know long, very long periods of time. Um, and so internal contamination is something that we have to worry about 
both as first responders and by people who are responding within the hospital system. People who are responding in the field may need to be in level A, which is the beautiful uh, yellow jumpsuit, or level B, which is the uh, blue jumpsuit. Uh, PPE, what they have on the back of them is a scuba tank so that they're not breathing in any of the vapors or any of the aerosolized materials. But people who aren't on the like physically responding to the contaminant are going to be just fine with an N95. The reason for this is that the particulates that are associated with nuclear energy are very heavy. Uranium-235 is called that because that's its molecular weight, right? So it's very, very heavy. So it's not going to turn into a gas. It's going to turn into an aerosolized component when it's mixed with like the atmospheric dust or uh, debris from a car accident or the powder from an um, airbag going off. And so we just want to protect ourselves from inhaling those thick particulates, but they will be blocked by an N95. So you don't have to, now ideally we'd wear glasses as well, um, but you don't have to worry about its impact on your skin. As long as you're able to shower after any sort of exposure, you would be fine as well. Like I parped on, we want to think about contamination like mud, but more so than mud, I want you to think of it a bit like a septic tank. Um, if a patient were to fall into a septic tank and break their arm, we might be like, okay, that's gross. Um, can you get yourself out? And they're like, oh, my arm's broken. It's like, okay, can, do you think you can climb the ladder with one arm? Things like that, right? Because we don't exactly want to dive into a septic tank if we don't have to, and if the patient can safely get themselves out. Contrast that to say the patient falls in and they have an open uh, fracture, and now they've got an arterial hemorrhage. You might dive into that septic tank or expect a first responder to dive into that septic tank to help with that hemorrhage, right? The reason why it's a little bit different than the chemical response is because nuclear energy is not going to cause the degree of uh, secondary effects to any sort of first responder as it is uh, for chemical. And we'll dive into why that is a little bit later, but we know from Chernobyl and other accidents that healthcare responders aren't really ever impacted by uh, nuclear response. So if this person is going to fall into a septic tank or, you know, have the contamination on them, we want to do the important things just like we did with the chemicals, which is get them trauma naked as soon as possible. We want to carefully cut off their clothes, not making sure we don't aerosolize any of that radiological debris. And then know that in these settings, external remover is over 90% of effective um, for the uh, radi radiation isotopes as opposed to chemical where it's like 60 to 80%. Next, we're going to move on to detection, having covered exposure and contamination a little bit more. And detection is going to be a little bit unique because a lot of it's pre-hospital medicine, right? And so if we have somebody who's contaminated, this is what it looks like, right? They're going to have it on their outside of their body. And we're going to use radiation survey meter meters to be able to detect that. And that's where these cool guys come in. Radiation experts can be deployed to help assess for radiation exposure, um, but what they're using are Geiger counters. And a Geiger counter looks like this. Um, this is not from like 1980s. Like this is still what a Geiger counter looks like to this day. All we do is switch out the batteries. They're the same things. Um, but what you do is you turn it on uh, in an area where you don't think there's any exposure and you count how many counts are per minute. Um, so five to 100 counts per minute is gonna be what's normal for uh, any just normal American soil, just background radiation that we have at any given time. Then you're gonna wave that paddle over top of the patient to see where they have any sort of radiological debris on them, if any at all. If they're having the same amount of counts as the background radiation, then you're in the clear. But if they're having double or triple, then you have to worry about having contamination on them. Here's just two other forms of Geiger counters that are available. As you can imagine, if somebody's very, very contaminated, um, the counts per minute might be very high. Um, so they do make phone apps to be able to do the counts per minute for you because trying to count 3,000 times a minute is not going to be realistic. Alternatively, detecting exposure is very difficult, right? Because exposure means the high energy waves have gone through my body, have caused the cellular damage, but there's no evidence left behind. One way we can detect this is if they were already wearing something called a dosimeter or a dosimeter, depending on who you ask. Um, this is a obviously Russian dosimeter, and what it is is a pen that they wear on their lapel, and it absorbs radiation doses. 
what's cool about these is they can be reset and they're live and active. So you, they can look through the little lens at the top there and they can see what dose of radiation they received. The hospital version of this is having these little badge tags that many people have depending on what part of the hospital that they work in. Unfortunately, these are usually issued for like two months at a time and are just more chronic radiation exposure and they're not going to give us live feedback. So realistically, unless you are um, working with the KGB or in the radiology suite and have access to reading one of these things, there are no quick ways to quickly check the received dose of radiation after exposure. So it sort of leaves us in limbo of what to expect, right? Which is why we need to educate ourselves a little bit on acute radiation sickness or ARS. ARS is an acute illness caused by irradiation of the entire body by a high dose of penetrating radiation in a very short period of time. The components of that are the radiation dose must be large, the dose is usually external, the dose must be penetrating, so it can't be those alpha waves, right? It's going to be beta at minimum, probably more X-ray, gamma, maybe even uh, neutrons if we're getting real fancy. And the entire body or a significant portion of it must have received the dose. The main way that we're able to diagnose from an early onset of how large of a dose somebody received is going to be through their vomiting onset. So this is super duper important that whoever first witnesses vomiting, make sure that it is documented and passed on to the next people who are going to take care of this patient because it lets us know what severity to expect over the coming hours. There are three manifestations of acute radiation syndrome and they're cumulative, so you don't get to CNS if you haven't already gotten bone marrow and GI. You don't get GI if you don't already have bone marrow. Um, and it, they make sense, right? Because the areas that they're going to impact are going to be the places that we have somatic stem cells in the body. That includes a lot of our peripheral blood, so our hematopoietic lines, um, our gut, where we have all of those cilia uh, that are helping with mobilization, our skin, as well as our brain. Bone marrow syndrome is uh, the first one that we're approached with. And small doses of radiation are going to cause insignificant pancytopenia, which is just lowering of your blood counts throughout. But larger doses are going to cause lymphocyte depletion uh, first, and then other cell lines are going to be depleted. Significantly, we want to pick a blood sample from day one and then check it again in 48 hours. And the degree of absolute lymphocyte count drop is going to show us how severe the radiation exposure is. If we're not able to do this for ourselves, we also want to record blood for any places that we're going to mail this off to, um, like the federal agencies who prefer to monitor these. Another reason this matters is because in studies that they've done, getting surgery done, any traumatic surgery, any life-saving surgery, or any um, things that need to be manipulated in the body, must be done in the first 36 hours before these stem cell lines start to drop. So as the trauma team, where we might delay care or do serial belly exams, if we think we are going to need to do surgery, we need to do it as soon as possible while we still have these stem cell lines available. And we proved this through a, a observation, but also we did a rat model back in uh, 1989, and they exposed these poor mice to some radiation plus wounds. Radiation alone can be incredibly um, high mortality risk, but radiation plus an open wound is going to cause almost guaranteed mortality. So all open wounds, all uh, orthopedic injuries, things like that need to be fixed and need to be fixed as quickly as possible. Now, GI syndrome and CNS syndrome have less traumatic effects because they're going to be latent stages, right? But things we might want to consider if these people are on our floors for prolonged periods of time would be abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. They're probably going to uh, develop some chronic malabsorption problems and poor gut motility, so they might be somebody who frequents our trauma clinic and needs follow-up. Similarly, CNS syndrome is going to be something that we see a little less common because it has to be a very, very high dose of exposure. Um, at this point, vomiting is suppressed and they might be altered, having dizziness or ataxia. And really, there's nothing you can do to help these people and you just need to offer palliative care. This is a summation of acute radiation syndrome. And what you might notice is that in the acute trauma phase, that prodromal phase that we're seeing on the left side of the screen, nausea and vomiting, headache, diarrhea, and fever might be all that we see as a result of any exposure to trauma uh, in this setting of nuclear radiation injuries. Um, most of the things that we think of when we think of true radiation illnesses are going to be much later on.
Now let's dive a little bit into responding to nuclear disasters. So, like I said, if I had to predict or had a magic ball of how nuclear disasters would occur in our region, it would be a nuclear reactor, not because I find them to be unsafe in any way. It's just common things being common. We've got 12 of them that surround us. So we should know how a nuclear reactor works. And like a lot of energy that we create in America, it just works on spinning a turbine. The turbine generates electricity. The way we do this is cooling water tanks, cool the controller rods, which have the uranium in them. And then that water turns into steam vapor that gets pressurized, goes through a tunnel, spins a turbine. So it's all hot water uh, related injuries that we're gonna be seeing if one of these reactors go off. Now, if something bigger goes off, we're gonna see something a lot different, but if it's just a simple uh, control rod error, it's gonna be steam related injuries, not actually contamination injuries to expect. Keep in mind that response is gonna be proportional in size to the accident. So if one of our radiation or our nuclear um, energy facilities has an accident uh, and you don't see a fire ongoing and you don't see um, tons of EMS, it might have be, been somebody just sort of you know tripping down the stairs. But if something bigger happened, like the whole thing blew up, then we have to be a little bit more concerned, right? And this is the windows of what to expect. Um, but the big thing being that if you see a whole reactor go off, um, you want to be away from the wind stream and make sure that you're creating the zones that we talk about whenever we respond to disasters. And that's going to be our hot zone, our warm zone, and our cool zone. Our hot zone is going to be our fire responders and hazmat, right? They're going to be people putting out the fires. Um, a uranium fire can burn for like five to seven days. If you watch Chernobyl, you saw how uh, hard it was to fight those fires. But the fire brigade at a nuclear plant will start by fighting the fire, but uh, they will need additional resources. Next, you'll have the warm zone. That's going to be your decontamination experts, like your HERT team, your HAZMAT team, your HAZWOPERS, anything like that. And these are radiation trained personnel who can get people decontaminated um, or could possibly be your state's DMAT or SMAT team. And then in the cool zone, we want to have you, right? You are the trauma responder. You're the person who's going to be able to take care of these patients and make sure they get definitive care. And that's where we're going to be doing a lot of the triaging as well, whatever your community may use. And so you want to keep in mind that you want to apply these uh, considerations after they've already been decontaminated and gotten to you. Finally, there are going to be some unique trauma considerations when we talk about our uh, radiation injuries. First is that, like I alluded to earlier, immediate burns are from fire or steam, not from radiation. So you might have thought that like, oh, wow, uh, after Hiroshima, there was a lot of radiation burns. But realistically, steam is how all of these power uh, plants are generating any sort of power. It's that steam turning the turbine, right? And so having a steam-related injury or steam inhalation injury is going to be far more common than having any sort of burn from the actual radioisotope itself. This is what a beta burn or a gamma burn looks like. See how it's more sloughing and irregular? This takes two to three weeks to develop, right? It's later on in that onset phase that we talked about. So keep in mind to treat any burns just like you would a thermal burn. Next, we're gonna treat hypothermia aggressively. As we talked about, we're getting everyone trauma naked. So we wanna make sure that we get them trauma warm too. Hypothermia is a leading cause of death in a lot of people who have been decontaminated. So we want to make sure that we're treating it aggressively, whether that be turning up the temperature in the back of the ambulance, if you were lucky enough to have any sort of temperature control, or turning it up in our trauma bay. Cold trauma patients die. Additionally, like I said, generating pressurized steam is how these plants develop power, right? And so crush injuries are going to be massive with these patients. They might be thrown against a wall, pinned against a, a roof. These are all things that have happened in historical events. And so we want to be uh, cautious on how we treat these crush injuries and make sure we're getting them to the OR as soon as possible, like we talked about previously, um, for like the fasciotomies, things like that, and closing our wounds where we can because that's going to cause mortality. Additionally, shrapnel from foreign bodies um, could possibly be a threat in these situations. While it's unlikely to have like a uranium containing piece of shrapnel, if you did, you want to consider, consider not ever touching it with your bare hands, maybe using a Kelly clamp, hemostats, things like that. And then before you can get them to the OR, want, you want to cover it with lead. If you don't have a lead box or things like that to be able to get it out, instead of getting the whole uh, emergency response team covered in lead, 
just put lead over the shrapnel itself, right? Layer a couple of these little uh, aprons over top of the shrapnel, and that will keep it only exposing the patient and not everyone else in the room. Additionally, if you're a first responder for any of these, you want to tell the hospital how to repair, how to prepare. Uh, bigger events might have already had the radiation experts die, unfortunately, because the people who are protecting the plant uh, may have already suffered um, death secondary to the explosion. So you might be the leading expert. So what you're going to be asking for is irradiated blood, ORs for fixation of injuries, chaplains, burn units across the country, and treatments. When we talk about treatments, we really have only two options. Um, recently, FDA approved uh, that can help with severe radiation exposure. They're going to be uh, GCSF, like colony stimulating factors, like Neupogen or Nulasta, but we don't have large stockpiles of these. Keep in mind, we don't have stockpiles of these in our Chempax or in our strategic national stockpile. However, um, after spending some time in Greenville, South Carolina with my chemical brigade friends, there are federal resources where they may have a little bit more of this than you would anticipate. Lastly, I want to cover that medical personnel are safe, like I alluded to earlier. Of the 134 plant workers and firefighters battling the fire at Chernobyl, um, there, or there was 134 that, at Chernobyl that suffered injuries, but the maximum dose received by medical personnel taking care of those people, taking care of the casualties, was about 10 milligray, which is equal to one CT abdomen pelvis. So you can see how even though they were taking care of firefighters coming out of the fire, they didn't know to decon them first, they didn't know all of these things, they still only got an equivalent of uh, one CT scan of their belly by taking care of these people. So keep in mind, despite uh, a lot of fears regarding taking care of uh, nuclear disasters, they are relatively safe. If you've ever wanted to look more into what radiation and nuclear events and radiation accidents have looked like, you can check out this um, Johnson archive. What it has is every uh, radiation disaster that has ever occurred. Specifically, I want to highlight the deaths over here um, and how infrequently they're occurring, right? So overall, we're not seeing a ton of nuclear and radiological injuries or events, but they are things that we need to be aware of and understand, but not really a big uh, threat to us at any given time, just based on history. So let's get into five chemical radiation and nuclear takeaways that I want you to have from today's talk. First, most chemical exposure risk can be mitigated with rapid de decontamination and supplemental O2. Like I said, get them trauma naked, put them on a 15 liter non rebreather, and that'll take care of half of what you need to do. But for the other half that you need to do, consider these five things Duodote, Narcan, Methylene Blue for your carbon monoxide poisoning, Cyanokits for your cyanide poisoning, and Calcium if you're seeing hydrofluoric acid burns. Next, for radiation, ask yourself if they're contaminated or irradiated, right? Contaminated is like mud, it is physically on them, it can hurt you, it can expose you, but most people you see are going to be irradiated, right? They're going to have had radiation pour into them, but it's not going to be something that they can give to you. Next, radiation contamination should not delay medical care. While I don't think that we should ever put ourselves at risk, um, from the evidence that we have available from Chernobyl, Radiation contam contamination doesn't impact healthcare workers in the way that we think it do, or the way that uh, the media has led us to believe, or or some you know movies may have led us to believe. Um, do whatever you feel is safest for you. Um, but if a patient just needs a duodote or an Narcan and they're covered in radiation uh, isotopes, uh, you shouldn't have any fear about your overall health taking care of that patient. Uh, lastly, uh, all trauma surgery uh, post radiation should be provided as soon as possible. Remember, that's because our cell lines are dropping precipitously, and so we need to provide any trauma care we can as soon as possible. And finally, disasters start local and end local. I know I said this at the beginning, um, but any one of these incidents could happen in our community. And while there are state and federal resources there to help us, they're always going to be a little bit delayed naturally. The first zero to 12 hours uh, you can expect as a local community that you might be on your own as assets mobilize. And so being prepared, being involved in your MTACs, in your healthcare preparedness coalitions, things like that are going to be things that help your community and help you stay safe. And with that, that is all. If anyone has any questions. Dr. Kleeman, that was a terrific talk with a ton of information that's probably not familiar to 
many people on this call, starting with me. Um, so I guess my question to start them off would be, um, what are the standards for you know, community hospital preparation? At a level one trauma center, we always go through this. We show everybody our decon room and talk about it and have experts around. But if you're at a either a level three or a community hospital, are there standards and you know, are these chem packs available, places like that? What sort of resources do they are they required to have? Yeah, great question. Um, so chem packs theoretically are designed so that no one in the United States should be more than 60 miles away, and that's including rural populations. and urban populations, no one should be more than 20 miles away from a chem pack. So when it comes to the chemical standards, um, that's what we're going based off of, and that's a responsibility of your state and whoever controls the strategic na national stockpile for your state, uh, depending on which agency it is. Um, for the radiation injuries, there aren't any sort of standards. However, in zones that do have um, nuclear reactors, they do have to have drills in their local hospitals. So a lot of our friends in South Carolina um, at Prisma Health, things like that, they have a lot of uh, focus of their education being on radiation injuries because it is a higher risk for their population. Because when you looked at the blast that I had on um, one of the, the plume sides, the blast itself and the radiation exposure itself only goes about a mile to two miles. So it's a very small local community. So it's the people that are around that that need to be prepared. Additionally, from a federal guideline standpoint, um, we need to have uh, a minimum amount of um, iodine available for anyone who's going to live within those zones, which is state funded. Thanks. Other questions from the audience? I'm sure there's a lot of interest out there. Scott. Um, I don't know how common knowledge it is, but from my experience with EMS, there are some hospitals that are designated as the, the primary receiving hospital for nuclear events. Others are considered only for workers of the facility. What's the difference? Is there one better than the other? What do we do? Good question. Um, Theoretically, it's a how often they drill on it and how they have the experts come into their facilities. So it, there are no federal regulations on how quickly you have to drill on these things other than saying you must be drilling on these uh, topics. So, um, for example, uh, the example I gave with Prisma Health, they have to drill once per year as the, the responder for that nuclear reactor, and they have to respond to all staff emergencies through that. Um, but there is no good federal regulations on that. And it, it's sort of the concern we have because nuclear is very regional. As you saw, you know, it's Illinois and us pretty much. And so it's going to be sort of dependent on how much your, your region wants to be prepared. Dr. May, you have a question. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, do you have recommended resources that individuals can use to sort of uh, re uh, to support the knowledge you just gave them, and sort of uh, a lot of folks won't see this enough to retain all of it. So, wondered what you recommended. Thanks. Absolutely. So, um, there's two sources and like training sites that I've been involved with: the federal government and DoD side, and Department of Defense side, and then the civilian side. And so one is in Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee. That's, you know, where the atomic bomb uh, was studied. But uh, it's called REACTS, R-E-A-C-T-S. Is, it's like an acronym. Um, but that is the civilian side of education. And they do have on-hands education as well as online uh, support of like Zoom uh, calls or even just um, Vimeo, Vimeo uh, educational content. Additionally, uh, MIR, the Medical Effects of Ionizing Radiation course through the federal government, that's going to be through the Univer Uniform Services Academy. Um, that's another option that you can do as an on-hands training course, but now they're going to be changing that into a virtual training course, which I believe is like three days. And so it's a three-day course just to cover some of the material that I talked about. And that one's really nice. I, I went to that one in Greenville, and it's aimed at a lot of the non-medical personnel as well, or people who are like military medics, so maybe don't have as much of a content knowledge into the, the biophysics of all of this. And so it's a really nice approachable course that is uh, good for all hands. And I'll type both of those out in the comments. Great, thank you. Dr. Gibbs. 
Dr. Green, good afternoon. Dr. Kleiman, really great talk. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I, I agree with what Dr. Green said, a ton of information. And I'll also admit to you that for the past 30 years, if I ever knew there was going to be a electron radiation exposure, I would typically run the other way as fast as possible so as not to be exposed to it. So thank you for demystifying it and providing great wisdom, super practical uh, stuff that we can use as emergency physicians and trauma surgeons. Really well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Any other questions from the group? There's a there's one in the chat box. Um, oh. What is what is the most recommended IFAC kits content in a sea burn contaminated area? Truly, it's um, just water to get the exposure off of you and an N95 to prevent any particulates um, and eye protection as well if you're going to be decontaminating people. But um, the power of water is going to be key, um, preferably catching the water runoff through a decontamination area um, so that the EPA doesn't find your local establishment because it's about a $50,000 fine per person, but um, just really protecting your airway and using tons of and tons of water. And, and the follow up on that, some of our listeners are in some under, uh, what we would consider to be under resourced areas. Would that be the best solution to uh, just just the decom with water as best you can and shielding? Yep, water shielding and then um, trying to catch any water runoff into a reservoir. So if you have like you know, that your reservoir goes on into a specific tank or you have a tank that you can turn on um, from way back when, that's another option. But uh, in my decon lecture, um, I just tell people like, all you really need is running water and you'll eliminate most of everything that you can just shower for like 10 minutes straight. Other questions from the group? A lot to absorb. And uh, for those of you that didn't see it, Dr. Clement did put the the course name there in the chat. Um, great, so thanks for that resource. If there are no other questions, we will wrap it up. Awesome. Well, I thank you all for having me. Feel free to reach yeah. out via email. I'm happy to. Uh, I'm a nerd about the the raid nuke stuff a little bit, so feel free to reach out. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Makes me want to live upwind, not downwind from the reactor. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you.